I started with this when I was a medical student in 1994 when I got interested in a patient of mine who I was taking care of who basically died in front of me, had a cardiac arrest, was coughing up huge amounts of blood and there was this commotion going on where these teams of doctors with the white coats were trying to save him and he was somebody who I got to know very well on a personal level, literally half an hour before his heart stopped. So it was really shocking to me to see this, you know, this conscious, sweet man that I had been talking to half an hour earlier in front of me as basically a dead body and they're trying to revive him and, and ultimately they didn't succeed. And I was left with the question of what's happened, what was happening to this person, this sweet you know, man that I had been talking to half an hour earlier, this conscious thinking being, and what is he experiencing during this process uh, of cardiac arrest? At that time, as I was a medical student, I didn't know much about the field, except that I had this question that sort of pinged <coughs> in my head. And I decided to turn to science to find out what there is about it. And I realized actually there's been very little work in this field. And most of the scientists, um, physicians, psychologists, have pretty much poo-pooed the subject uh, up to that point. And I think being very young and very naive, I decided that I would take up the challenge and I would try to research this field myself. Something that I can tell you for sure, if this happened to me today, I would not have bothered. I would have, you know, whatever, next, <laughs> what's up? But then I guess this is what happens when you're younger. So I got hooked on it. And my own training has changed. So I graduated, I went through medical training, etc. And now I'm basically an intensive care physician. So I take care of patients who are critically ill, life and death. And my goal is to bring people back to life again. And some people say to me, why do you study death? And the problem is people's perceptions are a little bit, sometimes not quite correct. So what I have to explain, and I'll explain here before we start, is that inadvertently through the study of life, if we're trying to bring people back to life after they've died, then consequently we have to study that process of death in order to be able to achieve that. And so a spin-off of this comes the study of the brain and the mind and everything else. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about. But because Chris asked me to talk about near-death experiences, and what I thought I would do, so this is what we do, you know, basically chest compressions and a lot of other stuff. And I work in the intensive care unit in Cornell. But what I thought I would do is just to set the scene, and this is really how my own mind has evolved. Um, because I got interested in near-death experiences because of that patient of mine. But as a consequence of my interest in near-death experiences and people who had died, I became fully interested today in the whole subject of cardiac arrest, resuscitation, bringing people back to life again, and improving our medical outcomes for patients, making sure that they survive more, and the ones who survive don't end up with brain damage or cognitive deficits. But I'm going to go through and start off with this subject, which has led to a lot of debate between so-called skeptics, although I don't I believe Chris is much of a skeptic, but he labels himself as a skeptic because I think we all look at the data, and I'm not sure, sometimes the data is not clear, so people can interpret it differently, but otherwise, if the data is there, then I don't think. So I've been labeled as being a non skeptic somehow, and I don't know why that is. I'm actually quite skeptical by nature, too, but um, I just try to weigh up the evidence. So my thinking has changed through the years. Anyway, so I'll talk about near death experiences, and then I'll talk about specifically research into near death experiences or what I actually call an actual death experience, because it's not near death. These are people who've died during cardiac arrest. And then touch on what it may tell us about the whole mind-brain, uh, you know, mind-body problem, mind-brain relationship problem, and also the problem of consciousness. So just to go back a little bit, the whole topic of near-death experiences really came into the fore around 1975 when Raymond Moody, an American psychiatrist, actually finally a medical student who became a psychiatrist, published a book in which he had collected the cases of people who had come close to death for different reasons. And what he found interesting was that these people all described very similar experiences. And he collected more and more of these cases, ultimately put it into a book. And I think my personal view is, I've never asked him this, but my view is that he probably got interested in this because he actually had a background in philosophy. He had a PhD in philosophy and had taught for many years at university before taking up medicine. So I'm sure many other doctors have come across this phenomena, but just you know, weren't that interested. But he, I guess, collected these and published it. And um, what he found was that people who'd come close to death essentially had an experience which, although different for every human being, nevertheless had a sort of a core of similarities. And so for those of you who don't know, typically what they describe is a sensation of feeling very peaceful, very joyous. They may describe a sensation where if they were in pain, they had chest pain, suddenly the pain goes away. They may describe a sensation of seeing a very bright, warm, welcoming light that draws them towards it, sometimes through a tunnel. They may describe a sensation of going to a very beautiful place, sometimes a sort of a heavenly type of place with gardens and streams and flowers, and something that they find very, very pleasant, 
and comforting. They may also describe a sensation of seeing deceased relatives as if they've come to welcome them. And sometimes a deceased relative, so a mother or a father who had passed away before, might say, no, it's not your time. And they may also describe a sensation of seeing a very warm, bright, welcoming person, someone that they describe as being full of love. Someone that they describe as being perfect, full of compassion, that welcomes them through, sometimes may go through their life with them and show them their mistakes that they have made in their life. And some of them also describe this sort of life review where it's almost like an instantaneous panoramic review of their entire life from their early childhood until that point when they had died or been close to death. And I don't know if you remember, about 10 years ago, there was an advert on TV for Ford. I can't remember it was a Ford Fiat, I don't know, one of the Fords, I can't remember. Probably Ford Focus, I think it was in those days. Where they were showing this, um, where they were showing this, um, some highway in Norway, in some Scandinavian country, and there was just like a, an elk or a moose that was on the road. Do you remember seeing it? And the car, I guess they were trying to sort of show the braking systems, and the car was coming at speed, and then it tries to divert from hitting the animal. And then suddenly so they show this scene as this little baby moose or elk is being pushed out at birth, and then it has its first birthday with a candle, and then it just grows older and older. And it took me forever to figure out what they were talking about until I realized they were trying to use this life review process. But that's pretty much it. You come close to death, and you have an instantaneous panoramic review of your whole life. I don't know if it happens in moose or elk. Do you know, Chris? <laughs> but in humans, that's what they say. And then... So that's pretty much a near-death experience. And what they also describe, which ha doesn't happen in all the cases, but I think it's the most interesting aspect of this. Because everything I've described so far, although I think it's fascinating, and in my personal opinion, gives an indication of what it's like for us to die, whatever the other significance of it is. Does it mean, as some people believe, that it's evidence of an afterlife, or does it mean that it's just a brain that's shutting down? I don't know. But it is an indication of what people are likely to experience when they die. And so at least for the majority of us, if we haven't done something crazy like traumatic suicide or something like that, we're dying through a natural cause, it seems to be that we can at least conclude we shouldn't be too afraid of death. Um, but what they also describe, which I think is fascinating, is this sensation of separating from themselves and being able to see things from above. So they'll typically, anecdotally, will describe a sensation that I saw Dr. Smith walk in the room, you know, he was angry, he had a pink tie on, and they'll describe all kinds of specific details that seem to relate to their own uh, event that was happening to them. And in many times, again, anecdotally, if you talk to doctors and nurses who resuscitated them, they will confirm that what the patient said was correct. The problem, though, is that, as many people have pointed out, there aren't many of these cases that have been properly validated and documented. You know, there's this famous shoe case that goes back to what? Before I was born? No. 20 or so years ago, you know. So the problem is there haven't been any proper studies on it, and that's one of the difficulties. There are lots of anecdotes, thousands of anecdotes supposedly around, but there aren't any published, documented scientific studies. But nevertheless, this so-called out-of-body experience seems fascinating because they describe what was really happening to them. So when this came out, it caused a lot of commotion because those who've had the experience largely believe that they had a glimpse of the afterlife, whereas those who are from the scientific community believe that this is probably at best a hallucination because the brain is full of chemicals, it's shutting down, and maybe at worst, the people are fabricating stories just as attention seekers. Well, through the years that passed, there wasn't many studies that took place, but some studies were done. Most of these were retrospective, so small groups, researchers would collect small groups of you know, near-death accounts, anecdotal accounts, publish them. And what seemed to come about is that pretty much most of these, these experiences have been described from all over the world. Um, I've personally collected over 500 cases myself, including very small children, less than three years old. And it seems to be that the core of the experience is very similar, although the interpretation definitely depends on your background, what your culture is. So for example, if a Christian and a Hindu see a being of light, the Christian may interpret that as being Christ, the Hindu may describe it as a, as a Hindu deity, and an atheist may say, well, I don't know what I saw, but there was light. You know? So the core seems to be the same, although again, I have to point out that this is a gross generalization, that there are no two experiences that are exactly the same, but the core features are there. And it's estimated that maybe up to about 4% of people, at least in the US, have had a near-death experience. It's a survey that was done many, many years ago and hasn't been followed up since. And then if you look through the, the literature, um, you find that actually this experience doesn't seem to be a modern experience. Some people were sort of claiming, well, why is it that only people since the 1970s have had this experience? Well, no, that doesn't seem to be true. There are many anecdotal cases, again, that if you search through the literature, there was a painting by before I tell you about that, the first published study is by a Swiss uh, mountaineer and geologist who survived a, a near-fatal mountaineering accident. 
and record his own experiences and then collected another 30 or so cases of people who had come close to death. And he published that in a paper in 1892. And he found that they all had very similar experiences, about 30 or 32 people, I forgot the exact number. I've actually forgotten his name now, I think it was Albert Heim. Um, there's a famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. And uh, there's also a supposed reference in Plato's Republic to a, a story of a soldier who died and then was revived and, and, uh, and had some interesting, unusual experiences. This doesn't project very well, unfortunately. It's the best picture I have. It looks better on the screen here. But what you can just about see here is a tunnel. This is Hieronymus Bosch's painting. A tunnel with a bright light at the end of it and people being taken towards the light by angel-like looking creatures. And what for me was interesting with this was that as far as I'm aware, and I'm not, I'm not a theologist, so you may know better than me, but the general understanding that I have is that you know, Christian teaching, neither today nor in the past, included near-death experience, this version of what happens when you die, if you see what I mean. So it was interesting, and I don't know whether Hieronymus Bosch had an experience himself, did somebody tell him of their own experience, and he drew it. He seemed to be fascinated by death. All his other paintings are sort of quite morbid. But anyway, this is interesting to see, and somebody sent this to me and said, this is exactly what I experienced when I had my near-death experience. So it seems like it goes back a long, long way. And as I said now, uh, these experiences have been described from all over the world. The core features seem to be similar. And they've also been studied in, in small children to, to a limited extent, I have to say. But, you know, this is not a subject that, you know, if you do a PubMed search, you get sort of 10,000 things coming out, you know, even through these years with all the media interest. It's still, you have to be kind of brave to get involved in it because people look down at you a little bit sometimes, unfortunately. But here's a child whose case was sent to me many years ago now. In fact, you can see I interviewed him in 1999, in December. Um, he had a, a cardiac arrest when he was just under three years old. And his heart stopped because he had a seizure. He had an epileptic seizure. And sometimes, unfortunately, if the seizure is bad enough, it can affect the heart and it can transiently stop it. He received chest compressions and eventually was brought back to life again. But uh, he then started to draw this very unusual picture uh, that his parents noticed. And basically, he had a sister. And they were both growing older together. But what they noticed, the parents noticed, was that although the, the sister drew all different kinds of stuff, this child kept on drawing this theme. And I actually had some other pictures, which I don't have here to show you, but it started out with a more simplified version of this. And then as you grew older, it got to sort of a slightly more sophisticated version, you know, with different you know, Mickey Mouse and stuff around it. And, you know, it's got facial expressions, etc., on it. And when they asked him what this was, eventually this was in the course of play over many months. It wasn't like an adult just sitting there having a serious conversation. But, you know, in between the course of play, he described that when you die, uh, you see a bright lamp, and that's what he had described, and you're connected to the lamp with a cord, some sort that he described in his own terms. And it was interesting to me because that was when I was collecting all these cases, and many of the adults had described they had this sort of a connection by type of a string or a cord uh, that they noticed themselves. And then when I went to see him, he drew another picture of it from, from me, and he was describing how he was above looking down at himself in the ambulance. And I guess it wasn't a pleasant experience for him, maybe, because the son isn't very happy. But these are very interesting. I've had a couple of other cases like that, too, where children seem to have drawn it. And what's interesting about children is that they're too young to have any, like a three-year-old is really too young to have, you know, very defined concepts of life and death, the afterlife, especially not near-death experiences. Because I think one of the very valid arguments is that maybe people have preconceived ideas of what a near-death experience should be, and therefore they, you know, imagine this when they come back to life for whatever reason. But in very small children, it's difficult to think that they have you know, preconceived ideas at that point. I don't know, your psychologist should be better than me. So that's the sort of background. And then when I got involved with this, probably around the time that Chris and I had our real debate on the radio, BBC radio at 6 a.m., both of us with baggy eyes, um, what I noticed, if you search through the literature, um, you know, I think most people by that time have come to accept that the experience does happen. Um, the debate, you know, although beginning people thought maybe it's just fabrication, I think by that time people did accept that it does really happen. There was enough evidence to suggest it does. The question was, why does it happen? And if you kind of break down the different arguments, you can break them into three different categories. Again, this is going back about 10 years ago now. One was that it's just some kind of chemical process in the brain. So as the brain is shutting down, for whatever reason, there are various chemicals released which we may not know what they are. It could be a lack of oxygen to the brain. Susan Blackmore had a very elegant theory that it may be due to lack of oxygen or some other process that's activating some part of the brain. It could be an NMDA receptor or something else 